If you like this podcast and want to support more episodes, you can donate through Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash children of the forest to show your support for the Forest School podcast. So we've got Nick and we've got Charlie. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hello. Nick and Charlie. So do you guys, for people that might not know you, should we start with Nick? Do you want to give us a couple of a couple of sentences, who you are? Why should people care about you? Oh. Oh. Because we're in the middle of a pandemic and we all need to care. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so I run the Curious School of the Wild and uh, we are not strictly forest school. We are a mixture of lots of things and we are also what we call um, semi-nomadic. So we we have a base that is in a woodland, but we also go and visit lots of other environments. So we go to the beach and to the moor and uh, we don't just restrict ourselves to one woodland either. Uh, so part of what we do is that we like to take people to lots of different environments and then obviously right now that's one of the things I'm really missing and probably everyone else is too yeah absolutely and you're down in Corm- Cornwall or yeah, you on so, the border yeah so I'm in Cornwall I'm right in the middle in fact um part way between Weybridge and Bodmin and we work in both of those areas actually but in completely different ways and probably I should say that we don't always work in absolutely beautiful natural environments we also go and do quite a lot of outdoor work in urban environments or semi-urban environments uh, just so that uh, a huge range of people can access what we do I do and then Charlie do you want to talk a bit about you and what you're up to and those things yeah, great. So I'm uh, a sort of Devonshire expat. I'm up in Sheffield now. Um, I'm still quite new, so I'm still sort of finding my feet in my sort of forest school community up there, um, up here rather. And yeah, I've been doing a few after school clubs, which has been really lovely, getting to know the local schools and the local areas um, and the sort of the differences in places in Sheffield so like the really deprived areas and then the really wealthy areas and what they have to offer in terms of their outside spaces and schools so that's kind of my background is going into schools and using their sites as best as we can so yeah that's what I've been up to recently um but before like Nick was saying probably in a similar way I was doing a lot of urban sort of stuff so going into schools in Bristol um, Mm -hmm. and doing more outdoor learning it wasn't forest school um very much outdoor learning we were at the OSPB at one time, Charlie. Yeah, it was. Yeah, so that was my last sort of main job, really. So I was working yeah. for them for three years, doing their outreach in Bristol schools, trying to get the kids outside of the classroom. Way. Yeah. Right. I do. That's but good. now we're all inside. Now we're all indoors. Yes. <laughs> in we're the most outdoors. urban. Yeah. Just chatting. Just chatting about forest school and the outdoors and trees. Well, yeah. So, okay, and I think uh, we all kind of wanted to have a chat. Um, Charlie, we were talking about it, sort of one to one, and then Nick, you. Um, well, it wasn't quite a blog, was it? You wrote quite a, a long Facebook post about <laughs> the uh, um, resources and things that have been coming up, and it seems like a bit of a, a hot topic. And there can be no better plan than to take something that's fresh and new and we haven't thought through, and to just talk about it. On yeah. the in- what can go wrong yeah we were talking about that anyway Nick and then I saw yeah. your post and thought yeah. oh okay well this really really ties in because um I think quite a lot of people are in a well I don't know from my perspective it seems like there's two camps at the moment of kind of outdoorsy folk who are doing that uh, for a living um and one camp is like okay cool I'm going to utilize technology and use this chance to make stuff make content and post it up and I'm going to do it as often as possible and it's a way to kind of um you know keep in touch probably and keep my hand in and keep um awareness of what I'm doing going with the community and then there's another camp of people who are kind of going "Mm, don't know about that actually not really sure not really sure whether that's something I've heard people say I'm not sure I, I want to give away my content you know I've been working really hard and developing these ideas for a long time and 
this how I make my living. So if I'm just like giving away all of my activities that I've designed and come up with, then that's going to put me out of pocket and I can't afford to do that. I've heard of people going, well, it's not really forest school though, is it? Um, to do all those things and to say, mm. just go into your garden and make a bird feeder with, you know, out of a loo roll with some bird seed stuck on it. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of an interesting one. Um, I've kind of waffled there. But um, do you want to explain it, what, what your kind of perspective on it was? Um, so that post, by the way, uh, that you mentioned, a friend of mine emailed me after and then basically labelled it Facebook suicide. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, <laughs> oh dear. I don't um, think that. And uh, I understand why, but it's because I, I probably have been a person in between those two camps so I definitely began thinking okay everybody's at home we can't meet in our groups and so I think I started off with this idea that people would need it but then to be honest within a week um, it, it was just flooded with content and so then I had to kind of uh, just think about why I was producing it because it was no longer because it was needed because there was so much stuff out there and then I also had to think about um, what I was producing in comparison to you know like big names big celebrities like Chris Packham was doing a daily post or a daily vlog and and then I just to be honest I thought well I don't know if there's any need for me to keep giving away content when so many other people are doing such a good job but besides that, I started to get a bit twitchy about the kind of inequity of it, which was really the reason why I stopped, because I couldn't, I was struggling to think of things that would be activities that would be suitable for everybody, no matter yeah. what their circumstances. And um, we did a few things and it was fine, but it was becoming more and more tricky, um, not knowing what resources people had in their home or outside and and then I also started to feel like there was almost this kind of competitive edge that some parents were almost sort of it's a kind of corona bragging like uh, <laughs> look at the fabulous stuff I've done with my kids today and I kind of wanted to not really be a part of that I didn't want to become associated with that happening if that makes sense yeah so yeah. i bailed <laughs> yeah i bailed and ran i think if i can go if i can speak to the first part of what you were saying about um is it needed and i think that that because needed is a really interesting word isn't it because i think uh, i think with the best will in the world people a lot of people saw a need which was for community and for connection and for maintaining relationships. But, but what they produced was um, sort of mass market, um, open to everybody, didn't actually meet that need of like, well, what? Because if I, you know, you take this corona thing out of the picture completely. Um, and if I said, why do people come to uh, my sessions, you know, and, and Gemma sessions? Is it because Gemma and I have got the magic book of resources that we keep hidden away and only we know about the activities? No, it's because we build relationships and we communicate in a certain way and we've built all those things up. And I think, so we've, we, I've done one video and I didn't share it publicly. I just made it for our parents and our children. Um, and I just had a chat on Zoom and read a story um, and it was really simple. It was mostly me going, oh, hello, what have you been up to? How you been doing all that stuff? And doing that, like, relationship building thing. And yeah. it occurred to me afterwards that actually, in terms of relationship building and connecting and community, the stuff that we put out to connect with our groups doesn't actually... And Now, maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but I don't think it needs... I don't think it needs to be outdoorsy. Because I was thinking about it and I was like, would I have the same impact for those goals of community and connection and whatever? If I said, guys, I'm going to cook pancakes at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. You need flour, baking powder and milk. I'm going to put the camera on. Let's all cook some pancakes together. Now, that's not outdoorsy. It's, you know, 
it meets that need, but it's not me going, here is the magic, you know, here is a lovely outdoor setting and look at what I've built in my garden, yeah. you know? Yeah, I know. And that's one of the kind of um, things I've thought about in terms of like when I've gone, oh, maybe I should be doing something. And um, I kind of I feel quite uncomfortable uh, sort of acting like I am the great keeper of knowledge about nature when actually this could, <laughs> for those people in, in that in that circumstance do you know what I mean like if you're if you're with people in the moment and together in a forest school session you discover something and you know you as a leader might happen to know a little bit more about exactly what type of insect that is then cool you can kind of sprinkle that in and chuck that into the conversation and but listen to what the other people are saying and respond mm -hmm. and spark off of them whereas if you're kind of doing like a an outdoorsy nature video then you're kind of there going oh listen to me i know all about nature and let me tell you about this thing and i don't really i just that sits really uncomfortably with me um whereas something like that you're describing Lewis, where it is just a a kind of thing like making you know probably i imagine you chose pan pancakes as an analogy because that's something we do a lot with our groups so they mm. will recognize that as a thing that they've done with you and so that will be a kind of reminder and a and a and a contact for that um but yeah, and similar to um, what you were saying, Nick, in terms of like, I am incredibly fortunate where I live. I've got the woods right next to my garden. And for me to kind of prance around and go, hey, look, it's really simple, everybody. Just go outside to this <laughs> yeah. lovely, you know, woodland that happens to be next door to me that we just go in all the time. Um, it just is a bit depressing for those people who are stuck in a flat or a city. Um, yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah, I was um, just becoming increasingly... It's also about the space you created. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, Charlie, you had a bit of lag. Go for it, Charlie. You, I think you had stuff oh, to say. Oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, no, I was just going to say, again, picking up on the point of why your parents come back to your sessions, and it's because, because of you guys. It's not because of the content. It's not because of the jazzy activity and the thing they get to take home on Instagram. It's, it's all about adding like a meaning to that place that they come to um mm. i think that's a really important thing to consider like get, doing a live stream like you say and um the parent joining in from home they're they're just in their home to the child they're just still at home they're not at forest school it's that kind of place based sort of thing that we offer um that mm. we really can't translate over the internet i don't think mm. you were talking charlie in our um just when we were kind of messaging each other earlier um, about like the possible dilution or simplification of a forest school in kind of inverted commas um, through yeah. online content potentially. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's just been a, a real flood of do, 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 let's do all these things. Um, whereas for me, I feel like when we're at forest school, we're very much being like, I'll always take along a little activity to do with my group. But ultimately when they get out of school, they are just ready to be free and they just want to run around, climb trees, dig um and sometimes just sit in the fire circle and chill and that is the essence of forest school really it is about being and it's about um sort of finding your own interest and not being adult-led um and i just think that like you were talking about the other the other week on your podcast about um sort of adulterating forest school by forcing activities upon um our participants i think this is kind of how what we're doing really by offering these online resources yeah Definitely. Um, some of the feedback I got after I had kind of bailed Facebook <laughs> um, was that people were starting to view some of the online content that people were posting as a sort of commercialisation and that actually that was becoming off-putting. So I think that backs up what you're all saying, really, that it's about the community and it's about the people. It's not about the activity or the doing. And I think yes. yeah. if, if I, uh, to, to sort of empathise for a bit, you know, we're all in this really unstable boat at the moment where for a lot of us, we had a couple of days notice that our income was going from whatever we were normally earning to yeah. potentially nothing. Yeah. And yeah. some people are getting grants, some people aren't getting grants, some people are getting, you know, this salary compensation and some people aren't. And I can't say I blame people for possibly having a bit of an internal panic and going, how can I make any money at all while I'm at home? And you just go, well, I'm going to throw this at the wall. Um, but yeah, I, my, and perhaps I'm coming from a, a privileged point of view here where 
Um, well, no, I don't think I am actually. I'll, I'll disclose that I have been on uh, Universal Credit for six months just because forest school is not a well-paid job. And so to supplement my income, I received some benefits. So when the income went to zero, I knew that I had enough benefits to come in to just pick up the windfall. And I've been very fortunate with things like mortgage payments being paused, all that stuff. Um, but I do worry about what the landscape will look like in mm. six months time when we go back if if people if the community keeps up this kind of activity 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 it's all about the content it's all about what you take home when when we all reopen we've we've almost made a rod for our own backs of how do we then re-justify being open and and being sessions again mm. if we've spent the last six months telling everyone oh you can do this at home in your garden you know yeah or yeah. also you um because you might look at it in a bit more positive way and think well um people are becoming more and more aware of forest school because there's so much online stuff and people are in that kind of panicky oh my god i've got to look after my kids the whole time like what am i going to do okay great like grab all these online resources um and oh here's the nature one that's cool and then if they when everything's okay again they sign up for a school sessions face to face for the first time ever because they've heard about stuff online and they have these um expectations about what sessions are going to be like which are all full of like this week we are all gonna yeah. make bloody bloody blah and then they get there and they're like oh what is this <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah and whether that will be a bit confusing yeah um, but i think you're right Lewis, in terms of like i'm sure like everybody who is releasing loads of content is doing it from a good place there's a very kind Definitely. of generous like generosity of spirit going on of people going you know i just want to you know make these people happy and and provide things for children to do and and get people outdoors and in nature and you know it's it's coming from a a really generous and positive place yeah it's just about what maybe some of the unforeseen um, results of that might be mm. um but yeah, I, I, I wonder whether this is a kind of, I wonder, I would love to know in terms of um, outdoor time, generally in the UK, how many people are able to get just outside um, every day and how many people are, uh, do have any kind of increased sort of awareness of nature as this time goes on, even if you're just walking down a residential street, um, whether you're because you're doing that same walk every day and you, you're not going anywhere, you're not going to school, you're not going to work, you're just outside for the sake of being outside, where the people are going to have a, a greater connection with nature, just with garden birds, for example, and things like that. Yeah. Well, I think the opposite. I think I've noticed more people, there seems to have been a subconscious message that you can go outside for your, your one exercise a day, but it's not allowed to be enjoyable. I've seen a lot of people really? out, out on a... <laughs> I've seen a lot of people out on a, a very, uh, I don't want to say like a begrudging walk, but you know, on a like, the walk is for exercise and we must do the walk. But also, you know, there, there's a, there's, I think there's a lot of a feeling as well of like, you know, we're all being told like, don't touch fence posts and don't touch the wall yeah, and don't yeah. touch this. And so actually lingering outside is going to give some people a feeling of anxiety and mm -hmm. of, of being exposed, you know? And I think that is something that, uh, you know, I'm talking a lot about, uh, maybe mentally I can't talk about what's happening now. I just want to look at what's going to happen down the line. And um, I, I do think we will all need, all of us who work in outdoor learning, will need some skills in counselling and in grief and in therapy. Yeah. Because there will be a lot of people who are going to be coming out of a, a traumatising experience. And, and we will be in the best place, I think, to help them. Yeah, um, it'd be quite good to pick up on that uh, grief point, Lewis, because uh, one of the things that's happened for me just in the last couple of days is because I was getting what I was starting to call Corona rage, where <laughs> everything was just making me mad. And then even things that I found uh, really helpful or, or pleasant before, like lovely pictures of the woods or the beach, I was just starting to find quite irritating because I couldn't access it anymore. And mm. then um, my tutor uh, sent me an article that, were, that was basically titled something like, uh, the discomfort that you're feeling is grief. 
Mm. And so I I read it and I thought about how I was just getting mad at things that I was never angry about before. And then actually, I have to say, I did a really good think about it and I did a bit of writing and, and basically just had to admit the fact that I was in a bit of sort of nature outdoor morning really and that I people that I love like Tristan Gooley you know who I like follow and everything he posts I'm like I'm mm. really impressed with and then all of a sudden I was like why are you posting that Tristan I can't mm. go to the woods I'm never going to see a wooden enemy this spring mm. and I, I was getting a bit of rage and then that just that article just kind of put it in perspective and I think you're right that actually there are going to be a lot of people that are experiencing one type of grief or another and um, for us outdoorsy folks I think that's pretty significant at the moment yeah. and so I think the idea is that we should probably forgive everybody most things especially if it's really out of character yeah because mm. um, we've not done this before have we are yeah. you trying to backpedal on your Facebook post now, Nick? Is oh, I, don't think start? I, I don't think I can do that. I am totally buried with that one. Yeah, no, no. no. I think you're absolutely right. And um, I saw a, um, uh, I read a blog in a similar way and went, oh, exactly the same, about grief and about um, how it can affect you physically as well. And one of the things that uh, this blog writer said was um, that you might be feeling really, like, itchy and disgusting and like maybe you are genuinely because you haven't bothered to wash during this lockdown because really why would you um but even if you have she's saying that is a well-known symptom of this situation of kind of feel you know everything being weird everything being new you've never done this before and um, you're really unsettled and um and I have had exactly that I've been convinced but I've got nicks like I have lit combed my hair like five times I'm, I'm checking my kids hair like a monkey and I and still I'm itching and so I'm just like okay well this is a physical symptom of a mental state it's very weird so I think you're absolutely right that we're all going to be doing pretty weird things um over the next few months and it's only going to get weirder um as this kind of sets in but um so yeah we all just have to sort of be kind to each other and we, um, were t we, we were saying before, you and I, Gemma, and um, I think, Charlie, we might have touched on this as well, but, like, one of the feelings of, of like, I guess it's grief and loss, isn't it, is, is, like, the feeling that, like, us losing our businesses and our groups isn't fair, like, and, and just sort of accepting that that is a, a completely appropriate feeling yeah. to, to just sit and be like, it isn't fair that... You, that that the world has taken this away from me you know we worked really hard we built all these communities we set these whole things up and now it's just being taken away you know and it ultimately i guess it makes us all realize how vulnerable the whole structure and the system is because unfortunately what we offer isn't mainstream curriculum and that's where we kind of almost get penalized in a way mm. has anybody arrived at the point where they feel like they've just had to admit that they will be starting from scratch when we get back to whatever normal is see i think i have and i said that to you didn't i lewis on the phone the other day you I did like, and i shouted you down and oh no like, it'll be fine it'll be fine and you made me feel better but um i just but i kind of feel i don't know if this like sweetens the pill slightly or makes it worse in that i don't think anything will feel the same after this but again yeah. that might be my mental state that i cannot imagine anything ever going back to the way it was I think it'll be like a new world you know and maybe there will be some some changes that are you know positive but it feels awful to say that when you're talking about you know such a huge loss of life and terrible risk um, I do think though that one of the one of the benefits of being a forest school leader or an outdoor educator is that it is inherent that we are lifelong learners and that we are flexible and um you know malleable and that we're always sort of taking in information and going oh what's happening over there or oh, is this going to be a thing that affects me all this stuff and I think something to take away is that like wherever your business or your community was I mean unless it got there by some freak accident it was got there because of you so there's every reason to believe that yeah you might be taking a few steps backwards maybe even a lot of steps backwards but you did it before, we did it before, you know, 
it's yeah. only going to be easier now because we've already made some of those mistakes already. We can fast track back, I hope. Mm. i just say I didn't necessarily feel like it was a negative thing that I'd arrived at the conclusion that I might have to start from scratch. It was actually almost a relief to just kind of let it go and think, mm. okay, whatever happens... And a bit like you're saying, probably, Lewis, I just thought, well, I have done it before, and if I do have to start from the beginning, that's okay. But it was a kind of relief to just kind of admit that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, rather than clinging on, clinging on and trying to save it because you can't. Yeah, and having a kind of panic, trying to keep everything running from yeah. afar or digitally, and that was more stressful especially when at the same time as thinking about our work and our groups and how to maintain some of that we're also you know having to work out how to not get ill and how to find food and all of those things and and yeah. just power spirits up actually yeah. and sometimes we can int unintentionally put too much of the onus on ourselves you know it's very because being outdoors and, and doing this work is our lives and it's a very all-consuming way of of living and and of um uh, and of earning that we can sort of confuse that with no no that toddler group that you run on a wednesday morning that's that's something you plan about all week but that's two hours for those kids they have other networks they have other communities yeah. we don't need to go and save everybody we don't have yeah. uh uh a duty of care that extends 24 hours a day seven days a week you know we need to look after ourselves and also to go you know I, I asked my wife and I said well because she goes to one of our toddler groups but she also goes to you know some church groups and some brownies and stuff and I said would you want all those groups pestering you and checking in and going are you okay let's do this let me show you what you can be doing and she went well none of them really are and actually that's okay I've got my own stuff to be working on, you know? And also, it's important to remember that parents are obviously going to be with their kids 24-7 and hopefully have a newfound sort of respect for the um, opportunities <laughs> that we offer for them to have a bit of a breather, maybe, and a sit down and a cup of tea in the woods. So you might find that you actually have more demand for forest school, particularly like a holiday club and things like that, where parents are just like, please, just take my children. I've had enough of them through this lockdown. So it might actually be, I don't know, a silver lining maybe? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, I think there will be a different view of what we do, whether whether that is um, viewed as, you know, the great childcare that it is or whether it's um, the communities. But I think there will be a different view on what we do. And I think, um, I think, I think I would like to imagine that more people will see the benefits of forest school to a family unit not just to an individual child to to go come into the toddler group isn't just because you know we get some we have some parents that that get this already but so i would hope that there'll be more that might go oh do you know what this has actually shown me how to just sit and be with my kid or this is a really good way of us bonding together um yeah you know you know you guys know where i'm going <laughs> Uh, dig in that hole yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we um, one of the other things that we talked about was like that need to be to feel productive yeah. and I think one way of feeling productive is to reach back out to your groups and to go I'm still here I'm still here and almost maybe selfishly to get some validation from that to get back that to people to go you're still worthwhile um but the other way that I think people are keeping themselves very busy is diving into like cpd and you know yeah. reading and audiobooks and um the amount of online courses and i've seen more than one um uh forest school leader training whether that's level one or level three um if i say nudging towards more online stuff in a way that seems like they are worried and so have gone almost all the theory learning online and then you only had to come in for like two days of practical for a level three or something yeah I don't know how long the, con the contact time would be but it was yeah it was kind of almost 
um, a, a sort of thought around doing a sort of yeah theory doing the theory online and then trying to communicate the essence of forest school perhaps in person after which to me sounds a bit backwards it's more like you would do your sort of learning about all the different concepts and theory and background and history after you've kind of done your face-to-face -face experience of forest school with your trainer because that is when you really are sucked into the magic I personally feel mm. Mm, definitely there's been um quite a lot of uh, response to this kind of idea on Twitter in the kind of academic world where um, people are kind of fighting against this idea that because you might not be at work and because you're stuck at home that you ought to be productive mm -hmm. and, um, and in the same way that say home ed parents are saying this isn't home ed this is schooling during a pandemic um there are also people saying if you think now is the time to write a novel then you've obviously never written a novel because <laughs> actually um it's quite distracting being in a pandemic <laughs> actually <Yeah. laughs> and um, assuming that your empty time can be filled with something very productive, whatever you think that might be, um, isn't going to be the case for everybody. It might really work for some people, but I think for other people, you know, it, especially um, possibly, um, you know, with mental health issues and whatever, that uh, some people are finding it really tough. And Just on a so, on a much lighter note. Right. Yeah. I have seen a frustrating amount. I am at home. I mean, you know, I'm not on my own. My wife's here. But we've got a nearly three year old um, and a nine month old. And I have seen vi people complaining on social media that like yeah. they're basically getting up at 12 every day. They're drinking a bit more and dancing around in their pants all day. <laughs> Pandemics are great. And I as soon as I can get out of my house, I'm going to find them and I'm going <laughs> to make them understand. <laughs> I hate to tell you, Lewis, but that's me. <laughs> I haven't got any children to look after, so they oh, are. Yeah. How do we kick Charlie out of a call? That. Where's the kick Charlie out button? It's Charlie in a pants all day. <laughs> <laughs> are you in your pants now, Charlie? No. Um, no. <laughs> uh, no, I, I know what you mean, Nick, and what you're saying about um, that, that kind of feeling you ought to be doing a certain thing. But like everyone's yeah. going to be dealing with this situation in their own way, aren't they? Going to be needing to look after themselves in whatever way they can and that feeling of like ought to be doing dot mm -hmm. dot dot is only going to add to that guilt and they're going to add the feelings of anxiety and guilt on top of all the other stuff you've got going on and the way that you're thinking about the pandemic so um it's really hard yeah to, um, i've appreciated people saying just play just cook yeah dance around in your pants and and don't feel pressured to have to do or be anything yeah and that, that's that's more how we are at the moment as a family yeah and you've got to you've got to readjust to you know if you'd if you'd said before like you're suddenly going to have to be in a workspace with four other people yeah. you know 24 hours a day we would all have gone right well I'm going to need a plan that deals with all the social stuff first you know we all know that in practice when we lead our sessions we go the social needs are really important let's like not learn about this for a bit let's just get them bonding as a group but how many of us would put that onto our families and go we just need to bond as a group and not kill each other right me, now me I'm doing that I'm doing yes, that. golden child. <laughs> yeah. Would you like a gold star? Yes, please, Peter. Yes, please. Um, yeah, we've been uh, doing the same. Some of the best things we've been doing as a family, I think I was saying before we were recording, but uh, so yesterday we just took one of our outdoor ropes and we turned it into a skipping rope and we were skipping in the road um, because there isn't, we haven't got a massive garden and we were kind of dodging tractors, but it was really good fun. And so we've tried to just find ways to still be silly and still jump about and it is tough but it is uh still good fun and actually they are funny and never have they sent me so many memes <laughs> <laughs> well i think that will be one of the things when it is that um in being forced to be together you know i think a lot of us as a family unit particularly if you have kids that go to 
that aren't home educated normally, you know, that go to state education or whatever, then a large percentage of your day is not spent in, in communal activities as a family. So when you get home, I completely empathize with kids when it's like, oh, what have you done today? And you're like, I'm not going to recite six hours of stuff for you. Like, <laughs> this is just ridiculous. But being, you know, but then, and I sometimes feel personally that like, I don't have much in common with my parents just because our interests were different. You know, they, they're not particularly interested in, you know, I did loads of music when I was a teenager, so I could never talk to them about that. And, um, you know, they were very sporty and I wasn't, so they couldn't talk to me about that. And so being together might force people to find more connections with their, within their family than they thought they had. Yeah, I think in a positive way, hopefully, hopefully it will. I think um, I felt quite grateful for my forest school experience now that I'm in this situation, even not going outside, you know what I mean? I feel like I'm kind of bringing the ethos of a forest school to my own kids in a different way, if mm. that makes sense. So when lots of other families that I'm communicating with are going, oh, you know, how's homeschooling going? We've done like an hour of maths. We've done this, that and the other. Um, I kind of swing between going, oh, shit, I'm not doing that. I really need to like be doing that. I need to be doing more academic stuff. And then going, actually, I'm confident enough to know that my kids don't, if they were a group, mm. if they were kids that I was working with in the woods, I can adjust to what they need right now. And it isn't that. I'm going to meet them where they are and go with what they need without being pressured into you know the social norms of what everyone else is doing um which I wouldn't have had the confidence to do I don't think or the intuition to do even though they're my own kids it sounds a bit mad you know what I mean as in you feel that your forest school has made you more resourceful in a way yeah and um and yeah, meeting people where they are, just kind of listening and observing them like you might a, a kid that you're working with in the woods, which you don't have time to do necessarily. Like I said, when they're at school all day and then they come home, you've got to cook the tea. You have definite moments of insight and connection. But when you're with them all day, every day, and especially in time a time of crisis like this, and you're kind of monitoring them all the time and going, oh, OK, what do they need? Are they feeling OK? Um, you know, how are they responding? What are they missing? What, how can I meet that need? I feel like I'm kind of bringing in a bit more of my professional experience there to add on top of my normal parenting level. And picking up on what you were talking about in your last podcast and the book by Dan Siegel, I've been listening to that and it's been amazing. Mm. And yeah. showing up, you're probably showing up much more than a lot of other parents. You're being really present. You're not sort of forcing a child in front of the webcam to say, right, let's make this leaf crown together right now and being distracted mm. by all these other sort of pressures of needing to produce something and to tick boxes and all that kind of crap. So, yeah, I think you're probably getting an opportunity to do that even better than ever. I yeah. think it will be interesting when we when we all emerge to see, because I think it will almost be like, I don't know if any of you have worked in um, or been close to working in like a reception class. Um, and and that massive meeting is of worlds where all those children have to discover that like what you have in your lunchbox is not what everyone else has in their lunchbox. The <laughs> like the way that you get up and have breakfast is not the way everyone else has breakfast. And they just spend like a whole year, con you know, sort of figuring each other out and going, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't like all play the like pants on your head game when you get dressed? That's weird to me. And all that and like. I think we will have a bit of that when we come back out and some people will have had, some people will have been sat down and been told to make a leaf crown and that they can't talk. And I've heard more than one parent say that they have been putting their child, I'm going to use the word putting, putting their child in their uniform still every morning because it's the only way they can get them wow. to do acad to do academic stuff in the morning. And then they were like, we let them take it off in the afternoon, but in the, like to maintain a routine, they have still been going, you get up, you have breakfast, you put your uniform on, you know, they've put a desk over in one side of the lounge or whatever it is. And like, may okay, let's, let's, caveat everything yeah, yeah. maybe that's what they need right maybe that child has all the needs in the world and that is the perfect way to deal with them um oh somebody doesn't yeah oh. um just changing the subject slightly 
Uh, Nick, you're doing a PhD, aren't you? Yeah. Do you want to? Try. I'm trying. Yeah. To do Are you able to? Oh my kids just... in the house. <laughs> is it on pause for the moment? Uh, no, it isn't, and that's interesting. So, um, so basically, I've given my kids the green light to not do any work that school sends them. <laughs> yeah. um, however, uh, I've still got deadlines, and um, yeah, and it and it is. And it's what I was saying earlier, really. So it seems like a really obvious thing that with all this time, I should be able to do loads of reading and get loads of research done and do lots of writing. And in one way, yes. And in another way, absolutely not. <laughs> because I mean, they're just, um, I love my kids, but they're in my face. They are like limpets and they're big kids and and they need stuff and like you said Gemma they need you to keep an eye on them and just make sure that they're okay and in order to get some work done yesterday I basically wrote them a GCSE art brief <laughs> amazing <laughs> so that they would leave me alone and let me just get on um so I am still working yeah towards the research but it is more challenging i've probably gone from about five or six hours a day of work to maybe two or three oh, still pretty good so yeah but that's only after i managed to get rid of the corona rage yeah <laughs> <laughs> before so, that it was probably zero <laughs> yeah so that's kind of a a neat segue because if we drag it back to uh, <coughs> something helpful for people to listen to, yeah. um, we were talking about CPD and, and maintaining learning. Yeah. And have any, has any of us got anything that you're like, actually, I found this is a really good way to do a bit of CPD or to do it? So you're saying you've got a couple of hours. Um, is, do you shut the whole room off or, you know, do you, do you have to do it on paper or, you know, what works for you? Um, I use a range of things so I'm uh, reading books, reading papers online, uh, watching videos so when I get to a point where I feel like I can't really digest anything else through reading then I might watch some videos um, and that can be really helpful and then I probably take a break and go and put some washing in <laughs> <laughs> and um, just to kind of keep everything moving you know academically but also um, you know, just domestically, trying to keep the balance. Mm -hmm. What about you, Charlie? I've just got some really interesting books through the post actually today, um, and one I think is one that Gemma recommended to me last time we saw each other in the woods at Deb Miller's Woods. Um, it was like one of the forest school gatherings. How to raise a wild child. Oh, I think you recommended no, that I don't one. Think, I don't think that was me actually. Oh, I don't think okay. I read it. Who's it by? How to it's Raise by... Boys is one that Gemma likes. Yeah, ah, oh, that might be really it. Like it. Don't necessarily like it. No, I'm oh, okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> the um, jury's out. Samson. The sorry, jury's sorry, out on whether you're going to raise your boy. <laughs> sure, sure. Charlie, I didn't yeah, hear what the book was by. Sorry, who? That's all right. It's by Scott Sampson. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, and then I've got one that I've been meaning to get for ages that I was telling you guys about in our previous chat about um, Forest School and Autism um, by Michael James, who's another Devonshire chap. Um, yes. But yeah, I did his training in 2016 um, around this theme and thought, oh, it's about time I get hold of his book to refresh my memory because I'm working one to one with a little, a little chap who's uh, on the autistic spectrum. So it would just be really useful, I think, to help inform that for when I'm finally reunited with him. Yeah yeah um he's great michael james i did some yeah. stuff as well yeah thoroughly recommend if anybody's looking for those autism in the outdoors resources he's fab yeah i'm finding that i, I used to get a lot of my uh learning done through audiobooks and podcasts and things like that and uh suddenly realizing how much of my sort of daily routine the uh, audiobooks and stuff only fitted into because it was like when I drive to the gym and then when I drive from the gym to work or when I'm setting up in the woods on my own and oh, yeah. all those times that I, I like you know I knew they were they were important times for my mental health but I didn't realize it was also when I was getting all my learning done all my reading if you like 
done. Yeah. Can you not do it now while you're cooking or scrubbing children or... You've had three-year-olds, I assume, at some point. <laughs> Would you like to ask me the question again? Do you know what, though? <laughs> when they're teenagers, they are the same. <laughs> they just talk to you endlessly. Uh, Charlie's laptop died, so she's... Oh, no. Oh, oh OK. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, maybe she's back. Hey! Yeah, there she Yay. Amazing. See, you did what I couldn't do earlier and you've joined on a different device, which I couldn't do. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the uh, the derisive laugh explains why audiobooks don't. And also, I, um, I'm i not someone that... Uh, okay, if I'm going to be really gendered, right, I'm a man <laughs> and I cannot multitask at all. If I am oh. watching the TV or if I'm listening to an audiobook and then, like... Even if I've just got the radio on and my wife starts talking to me, I'll be like, I'm going to turn it completely off so I can listen to you because I cannot hear two streams of, you know, I can't hear two bits of conversation. I well, just I've won't been, pay attention. I've been being really rude and um, putting my headphones in to listen to audiobooks while I'm cooking. And uh, it's usually like that's the kids TV time. So like 4.30 they are heavily into Pokemon, which I heartily approve of. So they're like locked into Pokemon and I'm on an audiobook. And so it doesn't even matter if they're, you know, they don't need me. They're watching Pokemon. It's fine. And um, today my other half was cooking and I just said, I'm sorry, I'm going to clean up around you, but I'm plugging in um, and just, yeah, felt quite rude. But it was um, really good. It worked really well. It was kind of like a little bit of, um, as you say, Lewis, like self-care, good me time whilst my nearest and dearest were right in front of me. It was um it was good. I recommend. Did you just did you just cut out Lewis there? I did, but it I did, but it was only you talking, so it's fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh just in true forest school podcast, there is an animal shouting at my window. I can a, large, a large dog. Oh. There we go. It's not quite the squirrels and... Uh. Gemma, I meant to say that I went in, uh, to the woods the other day for obviously some very vital exercise and not at all to just fart around in the woods. Um, and uh, the squirrels have like... And all the wild has just gone like, they've gone, they've gone. And they're like bolshy and everywhere and just like doing whatever they want it was <laughs> there was some of the squirrels almost gave me a look of like uh you don't come here anymore this is us <laughs> now yeah that's like the mountain goats in wales have you seen that yeah I've yeah. Heard yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah so I'm Go on, Liz. I'm trying to find. I'm trying to think of a good question to kind of round up and. Uh... Well, so I was. We kind of. One of the things that I wanted to to talk about with other outdoor leaders is, um, I, I realised that one of the feelings I was having about the resources that are going out and about all the CPD that's coming out and everything, um, was that I was feeling frustrated that I couldn't authentically join the conversation in the way that other outdoor learning styles could. So to, to give it more context, I was thinking like scouting and brownies, putting a, an information pack out with a lesson plan is perfectly acceptable scouting mm. and brownies doing curric, you know, curriculum based outdoor learning. If you make a lesson plan with Vikings in it, that is perfectly acceptable outdoor a curriculum based why is it always Vikings, Lewis? It's always Vikings. In all your analogies, you're always on about Vikings. Vikings. <laughs> always Vikings. What have the Vikings done to you? It's always in a very dismissive way as well. It's always like, oh, God, the Vikings. Okay. Do you know what? Maybe it's because I think near us there is, um, what is the, the place where there's like a Viking village near us? It's like an operating Viking village. Oh, um, Escott. Escott, Escott is very near us. With Alan. Alan. Bruford, yeah. Yes. Alan but anyway, Bruford, that's yeah. Off, off track. It's yeah, sorry. Taking sorry. me away from the Vikings. Um, but the, to do forest school, you can't do it 
online because of the, because of the nature of it. And so I was feeling frustrated that there were all these out, other outdoor leaders that could flick a switch and go, I can still do my outdoor learning. I can still legitimately do it. And I was kind of thinking, is is that what makes Forest School special? Because you can't do it online and you can't lesson plan it and all those things that we all like about it. Or does that make it a bit of a snowflake that's now doomed to fail because we've made too rigid do you know what i mean i is it yeah. is that a benefit yeah. because nobody can copy it and do it online or is it a detriment because we can't do it online mm. i think um it just proves really how much the spaces that everybody uses and that it's not just a venue that it's much much more than that and so much more comes from being in the place or in the space mm. and um if you are producing some of the online content like you're talking about lewis then you are reducing it to an activity aren't you yeah and yeah. that's not really what you guys are about at all um so i can see how that would be really frustrating uh, for us the biggest kind of change is that lots of what happens outdoors with our groups is just sort of silly and playful and you mm. can't really get that across can you in yeah. online content and so that's a bit of a loss there I think but then some of the posts that we had put up that were most kind of followed or liked were the ones where we were just being stupid as a family in a field yeah. and, I, and I wonder if that's because that's a bit more um well it's loose and nobody knows what's going to happen and that reflects more of what would happen in a group yeah I like that mm. idea and that um people kind of watch that sort of content and it reminds them that they can do that especially mm. in this time where it is very serious and worrying um watching somebody else be playful like that uh kind of remind like brings a, you can't help but smile and laugh when you're watching someone else be silly like that and it reminds you that actually you can make that choice if you're if you're able um to kind of laugh and muck about then it's a thing you know that's good to do mm. there's also something else i thought of when we were posting things that involve foraging and that when you do things like foraging with your groups, you have an awareness of their knowledge mm -hmm. um, as individuals and as a group. And so uh, with our groups, for example, we would know that they wouldn't mistake lords and ladies for wild garlic because we know them really well and they've been with yeah. us for a long time and we will have talked about it and we will have cooked with it. Um, but then when... Uh, and, and we did do some videos looking at wild garlic. And for us, that would be like the most basic of foraging. And then it just became really obvious uh, what the risks of that were, actually. That mm. If you're saying, oh, yeah, well, go and find yourself some whatever to pick and forage and cook with. And how easy it would be for somebody who doesn't have, you know, the experience with you and your time and your, you know, your yeah. attention that they could get it really wrong and so I, yeah there are lots of reasons to really think about what you're posting in terms of content uh when you're not there with the group in real life and it's easy to assume isn't it that everyone has a similar level of eco literacy to those yeah. that you are usually around so like if, for example today I was out having a little a walk um nearby and I saw some birds and I saw some trees and I was able to name them and I just thought that really gives it meaning to me personally, but obviously to other people that might just be, they might walk past it. It might just blend into the background. Um, and so that's really important, isn't it? When we're creating resources that we're making sure, not that it's patronising, but that it's coming, it's meeting them at where they're at, like what Gemma was saying earlier. And that's, I think that's was... the problem that you don't know where they're at, do you? Exactly. No. Yeah. I mean, when it's your group, it's your job to know where they're at. Um, but when you're, like Lewis was saying, if you're uh, posting content and you don't know who it's reaching, then you don't know where they're at. And then that's a whole yeah. other. And I think we've talked before that one of the it's very easy for people to conceptualize um, the risks of uh, purely online or digital training for things like um, tool work or fire life because you can you know there's that it's easy to say oh well you might get it wrong and if you were starting to get it wrong an instructor can be 
three foot away from you and can immediately correct it like that. Yeah. Whereas if you're watching a video or you're reading a lesson plan, you might go further than you should and nobody's there to correct you. But as with all, as we always kind of bring up on the podcast when we're talking about the risk element of outdoor learning in a forest school, the risk isn't just physical risk. There's also emotional risk. And so yeah. you might also have a lesson plan that puts a child emotionally in a place that they're not ready for yet mm. or you know um i i don't know but i would be interested to hear to, to sort of find out how many children have been put in front of these online pe lessons and have absolutely stacked it because that is not tailored to what they can do there's nobody you know yeah. the, the tv screen can't see them starting to pant or hyperventilate and mm. scale it back or likewise if you're doing an outdoor activity in you, in your garden you can't see when sticking those leaves to the the toilet roll tube is making your child really fresh you know you hopefully you would you would go oh a parent would see that but the same with eco literacy you not every parent or carer has the same level of emotional literacy to see when they're going this child is getting really frustrated now mm. and to be able to tailor it and that's yeah. that's a risk, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think lots of parents have found the sudden need to educate their kids at home quite difficult. Not everybody has, obviously, and then lots of people also have um, a level of experience with that and be really confident with it. But certainly, um, I was starting to see posts from people who were just finding it really difficult and really frustrating and didn't know that they didn't have to do it you know they didn't necessarily have the confidence to just say my child has been given this but actually they don't have to do it right now because like you're saying Lewis I as a parent haven't necessarily got the package of skills that the educator would usually have when working with my child and yeah so I think you're right there and, and also interesting to think where does our you know where does our liability start and end with the with putting things and activities online are we responsible if somebody goes and uses their kitchen knife because that's what you said in your resource are you you know would you put something out if there was an emotional risk to a child are we still responsible for that emotional risk if we've suggested the activity you know mm. just to be the voice of doom Really, <laughs> I'd just like to bring everybody down. If you could no, be a bit more just, somber. Can I be the voice of positivity a minute? And yeah. Yes, that for those people, because I'm really interested as well. Like, I, There's no way you could ever know this, but I'd be uh, fascinated to find out what percentage of parents sort of by the end of this isolation period, whenever it ends, um, have kind of looked upon school, um, traditional school, in a different way and, um, and seen some kind of... Uh, positives to not following a very rigorous academic it is phonics time now kind of I'm thinking primary because that's the level my kids are um, and if they have had some positive moments with their children at home uh, playing and being fun you know having joyful funny silly times together indoors or out um, and whether they've noticed positive changes in their children's behavior which I certainly have and I wonder you know obviously some children are going to be finding this very, very difficult and missing a lot of things and being scared and worried. Um, but there might be moments where actually there's a lot of positivity going on as well. And I wonder whether um, in sending children back to school, whether some parents will actually challenge the status quo a bit and whether that might be a little gap in the fence for Forest School to lobby and make a, a case for ourselves um, as part of mainstream education if you know what I mean, and say, you know, I think the um, that are like, we want our kids to play more, we want our kids to be outside more, we've seen the benefits of it firsthand now during this difficult time, and whether us as a sort of outdoor practitioners can use that momentum to actually lobby government um, or just our local school down the road and go, listen, you know, this is very important, let us in. I think that the children will do more... Um... Uh, not consciously but um I was talking to my wife the other day and I was saying about how um uh, so when I my time as a teacher I was the year three and four teacher and it was very much emphasized to me that your your job is to 
break them out of that key stage one is play and key stage two is when they start to sit down and do rigorous learning and uh i i look back at it now with some remorse but i was very good at like i'm going to use air quotes like breaking children in in they could that i would was good at behavior management and could get them to sit down and could get them to do whatever if you are a year let's say eight teacher and you're inheriting a class in september if they've all if they've had what's that nine years of state education they're almost not maybe resigned to it is is the way to think about it but if you inherit a class in september who've just had six months away from school you know have been feral <laughs> is is a is a secondary school teacher ready for that level of behavior management or are they used to getting children that are put through the system and they've just accepted it by that point you know are we giving are we light turning on that that flame a little bit and going mm. no no have have some five-year-olds again and just see how you get on good luck with mm. your gcse prep yeah i wonder <laughs> whether schools will have to well, I really hope they do bear that in mind in terms of, you know, in terms of kind of like a phased return, whether it's face to face phased return or whether it's just in terms of the what they're expecting from the children. You know, I really oh, wouldn't that be great it as like, oh, God, we've lost all this time. Quick, everyone study harder. Um, you know, can, I, we, I, can they just take the timetable from like this the, an early year start in September? So like, well, they're going to come in the morning and then the parents come in for lunchtime because they will have been away from their mums and dads for a long time. <laughs> and and then at pickup, we'll do a little handover book for the 13 year olds to say what they've been doing. And if they went to the toilet, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, uh, Jem, just to sort of... Um, agree that I think there have been some really positive experiences for people at home and being outside more so I was having a little panic with my research and thinking well it's all supposed to be outdoors and now everyone's indoors what am I going to do and and uh, can I use this in any way and so I just put a couple of posts up asking people to kind of give me a bit of feedback on their experience with their kids uh, just being at home and getting outdoors and actually quite a few people said that they found that their kids were quite naturally not using technology as much bizarrely wow. and that one of the other things that people were saying was that they're going out for that one bit of exercise that one walk or whatever it's actually much easier and that um, kids were not resisting that in a way that they thought they might possibly because they were a bit sort of desperate for a change of scenery but I think um there has there have definitely been for some people some positive outcomes in terms of getting their kids outside even if it's just in the garden or going out on their daily walk yeah and presumably I think people will be noticing the um the positive effect that that's having as well sort of afterwards so yeah. where everybody might have been slightly kind of getting at one another before the outdoor time after the outdoor time everyone um, is a bit more chilled out or playful or um just generally happier um and if people are noticing that over this extended period of time then you would hope that they're going to be uh, calling for schools to um make sure that happens a lot more yeah i would hope but of course at this point we're not even 100 percent sure when they'll be going back are we it's all very curious yeah Yeah. well we've toddled over the hour mark so i think uh i don't want to say closing statements maybe we should think Mm. of something positive to say to if we we were in front of uh a group of outdoor leaders what kind of thing would we want to say and because there are a lot of people that will be listening not just in this country but around the world and I know we have um, a sizable amount of the audience this is in Australia this isn't even really starting yet but they are they are you know two weeks behind us if you like so I think a positive message to to some people will really get them through can I go first yeah I, I just want to um, say about how singing and storytelling I think are two of the things I've noticed have translated really well online um to audiences to keep them connected I think those are two things we don't necessarily have to label them as forest school stories or forest school singing but I just think that's a really lovely thing to do together even if it sounds like a cacophony when you're singing together but it's a lovely way to try and maintain that sense of community 
And I just think that is one thing that has translated quite well online from what I've seen so far. Yeah. That's cool. Um, I think uh, for me, before this, uh, the crisis had kind of um, come to light, I was already working on um, something called the Tiny Adventures Project. And that was uh, that came from the idea that we can all find even really small ways that we can get outside and access nature um, and and that be accessible for everybody, no matter what their resources were. And so I was kind of building on this idea of tiny adventures. And now <laughs> it's like we need even tinier adventures. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so uh, for me, it, even though it is a bit unusual and a bit frustrating, um, it is essentially positive because I think it does mean that everybody has to give a bit of thought to how they get their adventure, how they get their outdoors, how they get their nature, how they get their fresh air, how they get their physical activity. And um, and, and in some ways, um, there is some inequity in that. But in other ways, I think it's been a real leveller. And mm -hmm. so actually we've all got to think about tiny adventures now and, uh, and so for me that's um been quite positive and and quite interesting definitely mm. yeah i think a, a positive thing about being forced to stay home um has meant a more kind of mindful approach to living generally and an appreciation of, of what you have so um a neighbor of mine said to me uh this week I, well, I guess it's just a bit like the six weeks of my holiday, isn't it? Oh, although maybe it's harder because, you you know, in the six in the summer holidays, you're off gallivanting, going to the beach and going on holiday and things like that. And so that's easier to keep the kids entertained. And um, and I, that made me really think. And I thought, actually, do you know what? They're, they're way happier right now than they are in the six weeks of my holidays. And I think that is because we aren't gallivanting off. We're just in the garden. We're just at home and we're just together. And yeah, there are moments of crushing boredom and there are moments of crying, but it's it's not as bad as it is in the summer holidays where they don't children don't feel like they have um, necessarily very much control over what's happening. Whereas now in this kind of slower pace of life, um, my kids anyway, feel like they have more control over what they do because they're not being shoved into a car. They're not being like, right, we're doing this now. Next activity, we're going off to this other place. Um, and that, that moment to connect with other people um, is 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 really positive and to connect with a sense of place um whether it be your garden or your street or your house um i think is a really positive thing um and i'm also really enjoying the online connections that we're having and this new technology that we're using to um to have you know moments like this where we're actually seeing each other and having a chat and i really hope that that continues so we can speak to people who aren't on our doorstep when this is all over yeah can we speak uh, again in more jolly times? Yes, please. Can we speak Definitely. again Definitely. in the middle of a pandemic? That would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> face to face, yeah. we need to arrange. Yeah. And we can, I don't know, hold hands and lick each other to our heart's content. <laughs> 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 I think I would like to say to the wider world that just as as scary as it is, I think one of the biggest things is that there is a lot of uncertainty and that we are all essentially alone with our thoughts a lot more than we are used to or possibly comfortable with being. And I think you can fill a lot of time up by constantly watching, you know, what's this update and what's this update and what's going to happen now. And I'm not sure that that's a helpful thing for long-term mental health. And I think one of the things that is going to be more important than ever now is reflecting and on on checking in with yourself so reflecting at the end of the day of of what was good and what was uh what maybe needed to change tomorrow you know so that because you've got you've got nothing to do but work on the next day you know yeah. there is there isn't yeah. time to be thinking what, what am I going to be doing in two weeks time because occupy you know it is almost wasted thought because you don't know what two weeks is going to be like so sit down before you go to bed Think about what was good about the day. Think about what was, or stop in the middle of the day. You know, pause when you have lunchtime and just think, what is it I'm feeling? Is it that I'm not feeling productive? Is it I'm feeling worried? Is it I'm feeling 
you know, is it just a body sense of hunger or of, is it just that I'm used to being, uh, busy, busy. And one of the things I'm, I mean, just to take it back because I really enjoy his work. One of the things that, um, John Taylor Gatto says is that, um, he talks about children being raised as consumers and that we are a society of consumers and he doesn't just mean um, physical goods. He means entertainment and um, products and other people's thoughts and opinions. I'm aware that we're doing this on a podcast where people are listening to our opinions, but, um, (laughs) but that, you know, how much of our day before are we able to generate our own interest probably not that much we probably rely on an outside source to keep us entertained for a large part of our day and Mm. maybe one of the things that comes out of this is that we realize that we can make our own entertainment and that we don't need to watch every youtube video that comes out or to to stick the tv on and and not be alone with our thoughts and that is going to be uncomfortable for all of us but checking in with our thoughts is going to make us better off in the long term Lewis, do you want me to phone you on Skype with an item of my lunch pressed to my head and ask you how your day's going at snack time and lunchtime, like we do at kindergarten? <laughs> with <laughs> like a, banana a banana phone. phone. Hi, <laughs> Lewis, how's your day? <laughs> I, I mean, it can be it can be a banana, it could be a vegan sausage roll, any any of those snack items. I tell you what, you <laughs> slam whatever food item you want into your head, and I'll enjoy it. <laughs> Just to help. <laughs> oh, well thank you guys thank you for yeah, giving you us a good evening thanks thank you very much guys yeah. cheers Take care. Bye. 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 if you like this podcast and want to support more episodes you can donate through Patreon visit patreon.com forward slash children of the forest to show your support for the forest school podcast 